Welcome back to the Dropping In Surf Show, where we talk about math and science and surfing. My name is Rob Case. I am a paddling technique coach, and my co-host is Jim Sigelnik, who is a doctor of physical therapy. Today, we have a very special guest, the 1965 world surfing champion, Felipe Pomar. In addition to his many accomplishments as a surfer, he has recently started a website called Surf Till 100. In his Surf Till 100 coaching program, he teaches you about longevity and how you can surf till 100, metaphorically and literally speaking. In today's discussion, we talk about longevity, we talk about fitness, and we talk about some stories that Felipe has where he's learned a lot of different lessons along the way. So I hope you enjoy, and we'll see you in the water. Aloha. Hey, aloha. Hey. How you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you guys? <laughs> doing great, doing great. Good to see you. All right. So what's, uh, what's going on in uh, Hawaii right now? Well, we just happened to have a huge swell. I think it's like 17 feet 20 seconds or something today <laughs> and uh, I've been having a little pain on one of my shoulders so I don't want to push it you know I'm hoping it's going to heal so and Jim and I are talking about how that swells hitting here tomorrow and you know we have no excuse if you're talking about surfing a 17 foot at 20 seconds swell. <laughs> well, uh, I, if, I, if I didn't have the pain in the shoulder, I would have given it serious consideration. Mm. It would have depended more on the conditions at the time that I looked at it. Yeah. Where, where do you think you would have surfed, Felipe? Hanalei is the place that was happening. Yeah, very cool. Very, right. very cool. And uh, you, you've had uh, shoulder surgery. Yes, but the, the one that's bothering me now is the other one. The one that uh, I had surgery on, it's not perfect, but it doesn't hurt and it works. Mm. Yeah. Those are the kawaii chickens in the background. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Very cool. Hey, Felipe, cool. how old are you now? Or how wise are you, I should say? Uh, how young? 77, about a week ago. Holy Happy smokes. birthday. That's All awesome. Right. Thank you. That's awesome. Rob and I were just talking before you uh, signed on. Rob was coaching a client uh, recently that's 70 years old that just got into surfing. Um, she's just learning. And we were talking about how, uh, how neat and how inspiring that is. And we said, how serendipitous that we're about to talk with this guy that's all about longevity and surfing till he's a hundred. That's cool. Did you say she's starting at 70? Yeah. Yeah. She wow. started starting at 70 and she is incredibly inspiring. That is wonderful. I'd love to meet her. Absolutely. I'll, I'll link you guys up. I think you, uh, you'd have a great conversation with her for sure. That would be cool. Once I met this lady that was 55 and she had just started surfing recently, and she had already traveled to more surfing spots than I had in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of blew me away. She's getting after it. She's making up for lost time. Right. Oh, uh, not only that, you know, the place was a really long paddle. Oh, uh, I'm gonna you know, three quarters of a mile paddle from the beach. And she didn't go straight from the beach. She went from where she lived, which was another quarter of a mile further away. So I once in the water, I sat her down and I said, well, you know, it's really a long paddle and you're paddling even lo longer. You know, you could walk and not have to paddle so long. And she said, oh, you know, I enjoy the paddle. And then she turned out to be a lady that paddled from island to island later on on the Caribbean. Wow. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that's awesome. She was very interesting. Yeah, that, that just goes to show you gotta you gotta ask questions, right? Be curious. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Felipe, how long have you been surfing? I started at fourteen, so you know you have to figure it out. My what is that? Seventy-seven minus fourteen. I guess it's approximately sixty or sixty something. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Well, I um. We're familiar with your Surf Till 100 program, and um, I'm a I'm a physical therapist out here in California. I work in uh, the Bay Area, just north of San Francisco, and I was perusing your website, feeling um, extra motivated and and inspired because it seemed like your message was such a healthy um, message, advocating longevity, longevity with surfing, and I was like, what a neat uh, idea, and so. Maybe, um, maybe share with us just um, how do we do it? How do we end up like you and be able to surf consistently maybe till we're in our 70s, 80s, or 100? How do we do that? Okay. Uh, I might add that although I was always interested in health and I was very fortunate to meet some exceptional people, I didn't get serious about it until that operation that you mentioned on my right shoulder, mm. which happened in my mid fifties. The doctor who operated on the shoulder said, you should never surf again. Mm. And of course I didn't like that idea. So I decided I was going to learn as much as I could about health to see if I could not pay attention to the doctor and extend my surfing life as long as possible. And then I started getting some results that were even amazing to me. And so that's what really got me excited and thinking about the fact that although it hasn't been done, it is certainly possible because I've met a handful of people who were surfing into their 80s and a couple even into their 90s. Mm -hmm. And so if they could do that 20 or 30 years ago, there's no reason why with the more advanced medical and scientific knowledge why we can't uh, push that a little bit further. Mm -hmm. So that's the way it started for me. What was and it about the shoulder surgery that made you uh, recognize something? Did, was, it, was it kind of a wake-up call? Did you do something different with your lifestyle after the shoulder surgery? Why the shoulder surgery? Well, you know, the idea that I was never going to be able to surf again mm. was uh, what, what pushed me to do as much uh, reading and, mm -hmm. uh, and getting deeper into information that I hadn't, I didn't have a need to get into before. So it was almost like the, maybe the fear or the sadness of taking something away that you loved because the doctor said, you, you shouldn't do this again. He said, no, that's not how I'm going to live my life. And you got extra exactly. motivated. Ah, very cool. Just so you know, um, you're my favorite type of patient to work with. Mm. The patient that wants to defy the odds. Yeah. I love I that. Understand. Well, I guess you're going to have to move to Kauai because I don't think I'm going to move to California. <laughs> <laughs> I can be your own personal physical therapist. Maybe I can... Um, be a part-time farmer and feed your chickens too. And you just house me. <laughs> Very good. I'm excited. We'll work something out because I do need some help on this shoulder thing. Cause you know, I still feel great and I still want to keep surfing big waves, mm -hmm. but now I'm concerned if instead of getting better, it goes the other way then I'm going to have to, then I'm going to have a situation, uh, you know, that I don't like. Mm. Yeah. So afterwards, let's stay in touch and I'll, I'll get some advice from you. 
I, I'd love to help you out if I can. Absolutely. Great, Felipe, that brings me to a question that I, as I was going through the site and thinking about um, your age in particular and, and surfing into the 80s and 90s, um, right. as soon as you get hurt, you know, at that age, and gosh, when I got hurt at 30, it right. changed my body mechanics and, and possibly even my psyche. But getting hurt, people will say this all the time, getting hurt at, at 70, at 80, at 90. Once you're hurt, you're never going to really come back the same. So how do you, like, how would you coach someone? Because surfing is one of those things where, and we all know this, that there are times in which you have to let go of those, those fears and that writ and, and, and accept the risk that, mm -hmm. hey, I might get hurt here. Um, do you prescribe, like, just a little bit more cautious or more knowledge or – you know, how do you, how do you work with someone that is maybe, let's say 60 and up and says, Hey, listen, do you say, just be careful of the risks, you know, don't hurt yourself or are you still no. like, you know, go for it. I would take a different approach. I would say, let's try to make you as fit and as healthy as possible so that either you won't get hurt or if you do, you'll, you'll come back, you'll heal faster. Yeah. yeah, and that's a strategy. I'm I'm assuming we can we can take on at any age. Absolutely. I, so you know, I I'd say I'm living proof of that because I get hurt all the time. I got hurt yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> well, how'd you get hurt yesterday? You know how it is when you're a surfer. Oh uh, yeah. The way the way you get over one thing is by hurting something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we call that displacement therapy. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yesterday I was just coming in. I was going over a shallow area, and my board kind of dug a rail, and I just went off the side. And you know, I was probably about six inches or eight inches deep, so I scratched my. I still can't see it because it was on my elbow and my back. Mm. You know, no big deal, but I mean some bleeding mm -hmm. when i came in people looked at me and said oh you're hurt i said no not really you know just a little scratch mm -hmm. well what kind of things have changed since um you grew up as an athlete like i i i know you were um a proficient paddle boarder big wave surfing champion um uh so I, I see a person like that on paper and I go, that person must eat right, train, do all the right things. But it's interesting hearing you talk that when you got your shoulder injured or in, in your 50s, then that motivated you to dig deeper and kind of pursue a different lifestyle to be able to keep doing those things. So how did your lifestyle change specifically from like maybe – sub 50s to post 50s what kind of things are you doing different that you would attribute to longevity well i have a story you might enjoy i moved to hawaii when i was 19 and i got there in the summertime so all there was was you know kind of knee high to waist high waves and i was always a big wave guy so, you know, actually, I was shocked when I got to Hawaii and all there was was knee to waist high waves, you know. In Peru, that would have been considered no waves. It was flat. Mm -hmm. But then winter came. And the first swell of the winter, a couple of friends and I drove down to Sunset Beach. And they looked out. And the guy that was driving, my friend Bobby, oh, we got there, and it was not only huge, but it was huge and stormy. You know, I mean, it was just this ugly, horrible, giant waves. And Bobby says, let's go out for exercise. And I said, go out where? <laughs> and he said, here. I said, you're, you're, you're crazy, you know, you go out there, you'll never come back, you're going to die. And so he said, no, we, we won't die. 
So him and this other guy who was Ke Aloha Kaio, one of the great Hawaiian surfers, they paddled out and I sat on the beach. And I was sure they were never going to make it back. I thought, you know, these guys are gone. I'll never see them again. But while I sat on the beach, I thought, I'm 19 years old, you know? Why do I want to have an early death? Why would I want to drown at 19? I thought I'll go to California, go to college, you know, get into something else. And on the other hand, I thought, and if I do that, I could easily regret later on that, you know, I walked away from surfing. So then I made a good plan. I said, okay, I'm going to stick with it for a year. I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to get in the best physical condition. I'm not going to stay up late. I'm going to get to take the best care of myself. Because if I do drown, I don't want to be thinking, I wouldn't be drowning if I hadn't stayed up my long. And uh, so, you know, that's what I did. I gave up drinking at 19. And uh, so a year later, I was totally into big waves and I loved it. And uh, I've been sticking with it ever since. I like that story. So again, it, it kind of comes back to the fear, right? So the fear of um, drowning made you pursue a healthy lifestyle. And then that led you uh, to be ready in that environment. Actually, you're very receptive because I actually, in college, I had an advisor who was a PhD in psychology. And I mean, in those days, people were drowning every week. Mm. Actually, so many people were drowning that the military made the entire North Shore what the, an off-limits area. Mm. If anybody from the military showed up on the North Shore, they could be court-martialed. Mm. And the reason they did that is because so many military guys, you know, they were young, fit guys. Yeah. They'd jump in the ocean thinking they were going to surf, and they disappear. They just wow. never make it back. So anyway, I went to my counselor, who had a PhD in psychology, and I said, I love surfing, but when I'm out in big waves, I have a lot of fear, and that makes me tense, you know, it tightens me up. And if I could be relaxed instead of tense, I could surf better. And she said, well, I'm sorry, I can't help you. And so I said, well, what do you mean you can't help me? <laughs> you know, there's always something you can do. So she said, no, fear is a natural emotion. It's there to protect you. If, you know, if people didn't have fear, they'd be, they would have gone off cliffs a long time ago and there'd be no human beings on the planet. Mm -hmm. So I walked out of there pretty unhappy, thinking, you know, that was, she was no help. And I came up with this little thing that I would repeat to myself every day on the way to the surf and on the way back. And, you know, it was something like you have the, abil you have the ability, you have the desire, you have the experience, uh, you have the desire, you know, about six or eight things telling myself that I had all of those things to enable me to ride big waves. Mm. And what happened without realizing it, I programmed my subconscious mind and I'm convinced that that helped me win the world contest a year and a half later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it helped with the fitness, it helped with the fear, and it gave me the confidence. You know, it was, I had the belief by mm -hmm. the time a year and a half had gone by that I could do, I could ride big waves better than anybody else. 
And then I got lucky and the contest was healed in big waves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's amazing. How much of that um, success do you think is physical for yourself or was physical and how much of it was psychological self-talk kind of stuff? Well, you know, it's hard to give it a percentage, but I'd say it was a very important part of me being able to accomplish what I did after mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I do believe that if I had not had that meeting and I had not come to that conclusion and then practiced it, my life would not have gone where it went. You know, what's interesting is it's like that psychologist when you were 19 did the same thing to you that the orthopedic surgeon did to you in your 50s. They, uh, they gave you doubt, right? I see and, your point. And, and, and it seems like you're a unique person in the sense that you're willing to question that and not take other people's words for it. I like what you said. Rob and I talk a lot about fear just in the podcast and outside the podcast and how fear is like, it's this spectrum, right? And it's like you said, a survival instinct. And if people didn't have fear, they'd be walking off cliffs. But sometimes the fear is too much, right? That's where anxiety comes in. Some people have a lot of anxiety and can't function well, but then, you know, you need a little bit of anxiety to stay alive. Maybe you call that fear. Um, so it's kind of like that spectrum of anxiety, fear, panic, fight, flight, freeze, you know, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm super interested in where I am on that spectrum with trying to surf, especially big waves. I'm not much of a big wave surfer, but I do like to challenge my limits. And so what do you, what, what do you, what would you say to someone who's aspiring to surf big waves that isn't, um, as proficient as they should be at controlling that, that fear. Like maybe they have the physical skill, but, sure. but it's tough to control that fear component. I have found that it has to do with being exposed to what you're fearful of. Mm -hmm. For example, if you live in California and you only get big waves very rarely, that would be a problem. Whereas if you lived in Hawaii and you got exposed to them pretty frequently, it'd be a lot easier to work your way up, which is mm -hmm. really the ideal way of, of doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, for example, even in Hawaii, when the winter season ends and then you have a bunch of months with little or no surf, when the winter starts all over again, you know, you're more impressed mm -hmm. with big waves because you haven't seen them for a while. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you just saw them a few days ago, you kind of adapt to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, it was 2012. I was out in Hawaii for about five to six weeks. I was um, working as a physical therapist for some of the uh, events out there with the Vans Triple Crown, the Haleiwa Sunset Beach and Great. Pipeline Masters. And it was a lot of fun. And um, yeah, I, I think I tasted a little bit of what you're talking about because like, you know, looking at big pipeline and big Sunset Beach would really freak me out. But then when you see it a lot, you're like, oh, I think I can, I think I got that day. You know, maybe it's a little more subdued than the day before. And next thing you know, you're like, oh, I'm kind of comfortable. And well overhead surf and I didn't I wasn't four weeks ago and so yeah. like my my confidence level in five to six weeks in bigger surf skyrocketed more than it ever had just because it was a completely different environment and if you know I guess you could always surf places like Chun's or you know some more subdued places but if you weren't willing to go out when it was big it was like it was almost like you weren't even going to surf that day so um, yeah, I would say that even going out and not catching a wave mm -hmm. is much better than sitting on the beach. Yeah. Because, you know, first of all, something might come and you might catch it. You never know. But even being closer, seeing those waves closer up mm -hmm. is better 
than seeing him from far away. You know, it's halfway there. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a metaphor for life. <laughs> that's very good. Yeah. So yeah, you got to take teach. action. That's, yeah. a, that's a good point. So you know, I, I got another. Yeah, go, I got go for another it. story you guys might like. So the same doctor that did my shoulder not only told me that I should never surf again, but he also said that I should not do any upper body exercises. And so I, <clears throat> I didn't do any upper body exercises, but I did surf. And then about 10 years went by and I saw a television program where these guys were working out. And I, I used to like to do push-ups. No, I'm sorry, <clears throat> pull-ups. These guys were doing a bunch of pull-ups. <clears throat> and so I decided, well, the doctor told me I shouldn't surf and I've been surfing. And he, did, he told me not to do any upper body workouts, but you know, maybe I can do that too. <laughs> and so I got a friend and we started working out together. And a few months later, I was 70 back then, and I found that I could do 18 pull-ups. And I remember that when I was in high school, I could do 18 pull-ups. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, all of a sudden, I, I surprised myself. I, I, I said, okay, I'm 70 years old, and I can do the same amount of pull-ups that I could do when I was 17, is that unusual or is that normal or, or, you know, what's the deal? So anyway, several other things happened and my confidence really went up and I'm shortening the story a little bit. Uh, maybe I shouldn't because, you know, I might as well tell the whole yeah, thing. Go so for it. I was talking to a friend and he asked me, he said, Felipe, are you having a hard time popping to your feet? So I said, no, not only am I not having a hard time, but I'm surfing better than I was 20 years ago. So he got very upset at me because he thought he thought was, he was having a hard time. Right. <laughs> and, you know, he thought I was pulling his leg or something. So a few minutes later, I'm driving home. And I'm thinking, well, I know I'm surfing better than I was 20 years ago, but it's very hard to prove, you know, how do you prove that? Yeah. And so then I thought, well, okay, I can't prove that. But in the 1960s, I won this international paddleboard race. And the time that I took to paddle the six miles was in a book and I said, I feel good enough that I'm going to attempt to improve on my winning time of it was like 46 years ago or something. And I had read in a book that if you announce things publicly, you know, you're more likely to yeah. do them. So I announced that I was going to go back to Peru. I was going to redo the race and I was going to try to improve on my time. And the Peruvian Surfing Federation set it up and we did a race and I improved on my winning time of 47 years ago. That's awesome. Yeah, you know, so, so all of the, that's really where my friend Tom Woods, he came down with me also and he did the race as well. And that's where we decided we got something that is worth sharing. You know, because at that point, it was obvious that your typical 70-year-old can't do the stuff he was doing at 23 better if it's a physical thing, you know, like a six-mile paddle race. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is a remarkable. Um, and it's a great example, I think, of some might say your uh, stubbornness, but I, I might say your perseverance. Uh, yes, it's so definitely it one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, your Surf to 100, it really combines the psychology of, of believing first that you can uh, and that you will. 
and then backing it up with the the physical uh, side of it, as well as I believe you also uh, provide advice on on just lifestyle habits. Is that right? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, you've hit on something very important. Belief is huge. You know, the guy who thinks, oh, I'm retiring now, so I can't do anything. Well, he's not going to do anything. And the person who thinks, you know, I'm going to do that, his chances grow exponentially once he makes a decision because he believes he can do it. Mm -hmm. So that is huge. And actually, to answer your question, my friend Tom Woods, who I just mentioned a few minutes ago, he did the race with me in Peru. He's a very deep thinker. And uh, so when we realized that we had something that was worth sharing, uh, meaning, you know, the, we call it banishing the, the aging myth. Okay. You know, if we can banish the aging myth, he said, well, if we're going to show people how to extend their life another 20 years, which, you know, a hundred years ago, 20 years was a lifetime. So that's like another lifetime. Then we should also give them some ideas on what they should do for those additional, for that additional lifetime to improve the world and leave it a better place. So all of that is part of our Surf Till 100. Yeah, I really like that. I'm, I'm, I'm interested if um, what surfing has to do with making it to 100, right? Because okay. you can have people that live to be 100, right? And maybe, you know, um, uh, what was that book? The China Study. It was all about uh, individuals in China that lived to be 100 and what they did for diet and lifestyle and things like that and how it compared to um, Western culture. Right. So I'm curious, like, I mean, just from my own personal experience, surfing, I think, gives me a lot of confidence or self-efficacy or things that kind of like maybe transpire into other ways that I carry myself in other aspects of life. It does, but it also gives you a lot of joy and happiness. Yeah. And so, you see, that's huge. I mean, take two people, one of them loves life. He can't wait to yeah. jump out of bed in the morning and, you know, go in the ocean or whatever he likes to do. And the other person is bored and, you know, doesn't have anything he, he loves. He has no passion. Which one do you think is going to live longer? Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's it. I think, that's, I think that was kind of where I was touching is, um, and I know you, we can't predict the future, but if we're going to make it to 100, we need something like surfing in our lives. Absolutely. Right? Like, Absolutely. Whether, I mean, whatever it is, something that gives us that, like you said, that joy, that um, uh, that kind of like, I want to wake up and do this. Uh, exactly. That's a, that's a big ingredient. I, I think, I, I believe in Japan, they got a name. I think it's called Ichibai or something like that. And it's the thing that gets you going. <laughs> mm. Yeah, you know, like I've, I've read a lot about Centurions and, and there's the, the popular Blue Zone uh, studies. Correct. And, and Sense of Purpose is one of the major pinnacles of that. And, you know, surfing can be a sense of purpose because it brings you joy, but but I think you're you're – trying to expand people's minds around more than just that. Um, Absolutely. With some of the trips that you're doing, like to, to Peru and tell us about that and, and the uh, person's experience on one of those trips. Very good. Well, here's the interesting thing. If I ask most people, where did surfing begin? You know, where was it born? most people will say Hawaii. And it's true that modern surfing expanded from the Hawaiian Islands to the rest of the world. But what most people don't realize is that thousands of years before modern surfing, 
there's a place in northern Peru where people were have been riding waves for over 4,000 years continuously, and they're still doing it today. So, you know, if you go down to this town called Huanchaco, which is where we're going to go on the expedition, you can see the fishermen riding waves on their same paddle boards that they've been doing it for thousands of years. And uh, a lot of the societies that lived on the coast, on the northern coast of Peru, their entire life was related to the ocean and the waves. It was part of their religion and it was part of their livelihood and it was, you know, it was where they got their food. And there are these crowns that have waves on them and there's these carvings that have waves on them and the last time we were there they had found this mural that was about six feet tall that was a giant wave you know so there's a they're finding a lot of these uh archaeological sites and uh, so it has to do with the ancient history of surfing that most people know very little about. Mm. Yeah, and these, and these paddle right. boards that you're talking about, they're made of, of these reeds, right? These uh, just dried out reeds that are woven together. And it, exactly. it, it looks like, a, like an old canoe almost, but they're standing or kneeling on it and they're fishing off of it, and, right? Is that right? Exactly, but here's the interesting part. When the Spanish conquistadors arrived in Peru, which is around the year 1600, they had people that wrote down what they observed. So, you know, and those writings are still available. And so the first Westerners to witness the fishermen in this area wrote that they would use different paddle boards according to the conditions of the ocean, of the surf. Interesting. And so they had the larger paddle boards that they would paddle with half a bamboo, and they would use those when the waves were small, and they had small ones that they would paddle with their arms that they would use when the waves were up, when the waves were big. And there's even descriptions of them going under the waves like wild ducks. So they were duck diving. They were duck diving. That's amazing. Yeah, you know. And when I grew up, you know, my first years in the 60s and 70s, the 50s, there was no such thing as duck diving because we were using 10-foot boards. You know, you would turn over, they called it turtle. You'd turn over and hold the nose of the board down. But these guys were doing it thousands of years ago. That's amazing. It is, it's very, very interesting. There's a lot of history there and they keep discovering new things and they keep dating the use of those paddle boards further and further wow. back. And they still use them today. They still use them today, and actually, that ties into something else. A friend who's a movie maker and I started making a movie in the 1990s about these fishermen who have been riding waves for thousands of years. And in the process, we interviewed somebody by the name of Thor Heyerdahl. Does that ring a bell for either of you? I had to I, look him up. Yeah, I looked him up when I uh, checked out your website, actually. Yeah. Okay. I, I didn't know who it was. No problem. Yeah, you know, it's, if you were older, you would have. <laughs> anyway, we met Thor Heyerdahl. He came down for a ocean festival that we organized. And so in this film that's taken us over 30 years to make, we interview Thor Heyerdahl. 
and ask him a bunch of questions about the beginnings of surfing and so on and so forth. And my friend, the movie maker, his name is Phil Wilson. He called me a couple of months ago and he said, well, you know, we've been making this movie for 30 years. Maybe I better finish it because otherwise it's never going to get finished. And so anyway, he finished the movie. And just about that time, we heard that the, you know, the descendants of those fishermen that have been doing it for 4,000 or 5,000 years are having a difficult time surviving today because large fishing boats come in and they're fishing out the areas that are supposed to be set aside for them. You know, a lot of people in Peru have realized that these guys have a history of about 5,000 years and it's worth, it's worth preserving. And so we don't want them to die out. And they have two threats. One is the fact that these larger fishing boats come in and they destroy their nets and take their fish. And then the town where they have survived is growing and the place where they grow their reeds are being threatened. You know, land developers want to build houses and they, they want to cover up their places where they grow their reeds. Mm -hmm. So my partners from Surf Till 100 and I have decided that we're going to promote this movie, get as many people as possible to watch it because it's the history of these ancient surfing, surfing fishermen. Yeah. And after we show the movie, we're going to ask the people that want to, to make a contribution and Save the Waves is going to receive that money and channel it to the World Surfing Reserve in Huanchaco. And they're going to use the money to buy some buoys, buy a boat to patrol the area. The Navy, of, the Peruvian Navy has agreed to provide Navy personnel, you know, on that boat that we're going to buy so that the area can be patrolled and hire an attorney to help preserve the areas where the reeds are grown. What so a great that, idea. Yeah, you know, it's worth doing. I mean, it's our history. And mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden, surfing turns out to be one of the oldest sports in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these, uh, the descendants of the, of the fishermen, they, they still live off the ocean like their ancestors did? Until very recently, let's say until 10 years ago, they lived just like their ancestors did. But in recent years, they've told me that in the old days, they used to go out and get 100 kilos of fish. And now they go out and just get a few kilos. So mm. when, they, when, they, when they don't get enough fish nowadays, they either take tourists out to catch waves on their reed boards or the younger ones are teaching surfing. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's less and less of the children of the fishermen that are going out and just living off of the fishing. Yeah. When do you plan to, um, maybe it's hard to say with our COVID climate, but when, when are you going to uh, think you're going to do that movie and release it? Yes, our plan is instead of releasing the movie right off the bat, we want to do a couple of educational programs mm -hmm. so that people have a better appreciation and better understanding of what they're looking at when we show the movie. Mm -hmm. And so we figure that it's probably going to take us hopefully 60 days or something to do the previous chapters. 
and hopefully we'll be showing the movie within the next uh, 90 days. That's great. Yeah, yeah. that's our plan. You'll have well, to keep us posted on yeah, that. Yeah, I was going to say, you're going to have to let us know. We'll, uh... Right on. Thank you. Yes, we're going to appreciate if you guys would help us put out the word. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That seems like uh, something Surf Rider Foundation needs to get behind. As a matter of fact, my friend Glenn Henning was one of the founders of the Surf Rider Foundation. Uh, and I spoke to him recently and he already volunteered to put the word out. So that is good cool. thinking. And, uh, you know, fortunately, Glenn is a good guy. So he's, he's agreed to do that for us. Mm. So these expect, uh, expeditions you do with folks, um, you, you go to that, that fishing town. Uh, on Chaco. Um, yes. what, what's that like? Like uh, you, you take, are these usually people from the States and what's their experience like when you take them to that fishing village with that kind of culture? And Well, very good. Uh, if you remember, I mentioned the surf festival. Mm -hmm. We did several of those in the 1980s and the early 90s. And so since I'm from Peru, I've been taking, I've been going down with friends or taking a few people down for many years. And it just turned out that everybody loves Juan Chaco for some reason. It's, you know, it's a very, very cool little town. And you have these uh, surfing fishermen. And of course, most of the people probably everybody I've ever taken with me were all surfers. So they appreciate the surfing fishermen and there's a lot of cool little restaurants and there's great food. And Chicama, which is known as the longest wave in the world, is about an hour away. So when we go to Huanchaco, eh, you know, we surf there because there's, there's a very good point wave right there. And we enjoy the people and see the surfing fishermen. And then we go to see the temples. And uh, when the conditions are right, we go to Chicama. So, you know, it turns out to be a, a very complete kind of a expedition where people go back with some great experiences and a lot of knowledge plus with a little luck they catch the longest wave of their life the longest <laughs> ride you know they've ever had that sounds like fun it is and here's another funny story so chikama is known worldwide as having the longest wave in the world and an hour away, there's a longer wave. No way. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've heard that same story about um, Pavonis in Costa Rica. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thing is, thing is, just the locals trying to get you away from that wave. <laughs> no, in Peru, it's real. Yeah, I bet it is. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Laird Hamilton told me that he went to the other wave the you know the longer one i think it was last year and he caught a five minute ride wow, wow. that's awesome that's pretty amazing five yeah. minutes on a wave i've never been to chicama but i i've heard from friends in this area that have done surf trips there that it's changed quite a bit the town has changed the wave i don't think it has changed yeah yeah more tourists um I hear there's a zodiac. Correct. It kind of goes back and forth. It takes people up and down the point or up the, up the Correct. point. In the old days, when there was no zodiac, people were typically picked up by their friend's car and driven back up to the point. Because, you know, it takes you a long time to walk it. You'd only get two waves or something. If you wow. had to, yeah. It wow. is a really long ride. That's amazing. That's really cool. And they uh, also have comfortable places now. In the old days, it was very, very uncomfortable to stay, you know, to spend the night there. So with these expeditions, about 
how big are the groups? Is it the group and you, or does Tom Woods go? And I know you're affiliated with Jeff Hackman. Is right. he involved in that expedition as well? Or Correct. The plan, we were going to do it this year in May, and then COVID happened. Mm. So that ended that plan. So we're hoping that for 2021, things will be better. And it is Tom, Jeff, and I. So it's the three of us. And I believe we were sh shooting for 16 people. Mm, cool. You know, it was, it was a number that the three of us can work with. It's not too big. Everybody gets special attention. Mm. And we can break it up into two or three groups so that we're not 16 people arriving together at any <laughs> one surfing spot, which is not so cool. <laughs> Yeah, you always have to walk separately or leave a 10-minute gap in between your buddies when you go to those spots. Well, you see, in Peru, <laughs> Peru's unusual from the standpoint that there are so many unridden waves, undiscovered waves even, that people still welcome. You know, you could show up with five or six guys and everybody would be stoked to meet, you know, these new guys that just arrived. So, you know, it's probably like going back 40 years or something. Wow, that sounds great. Yeah, it's unusual. And then what's the flow of the, um, the day? Is it um, you guys are doing surf coaching? Is it more holistic uh, on land doing almost like, uh, I know, um, Tom Woods is uh, a bit of a uh, life coach. Is that right? Uh, not really. He's more of a health researcher. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so is there more, um, what happens out of the water? I imagine you guys surf together and then you come in, do you eat, do you talk well, theory, talk shop, go over good, exercise? Or Good point. Since every surfer, every surf, the main thing is, uh, we plan things according to what, what the waves are doing. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, we try to spend a couple of hours every day talking about health and longevity. You Very know, cool. we share things that we know will help people stay healthy or surf longer, mm -hmm. all of that kind of stuff. So we do all of that, of course, on land. Mm -hmm. typically in the afternoon or the early evening. And then in the ocean, there's no coaching at all. You know, we just go surfing. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. What's your um, kind of daily routine, Felipe, as someone who's surfing at 77? And uh, it's, what, what do you do? What do you wake up? Take us through it. Very good. The planning starts the previous night. I try to go to bed early mm. because, you know, what time I get up is going to be dependent on what time I went to bed. Mm. Uh, I used to use an alarm clock. I haven't done that for quite a while. I'll normally sleep for seven or eight hours and then wake up. So if I manage to go to bed by 10 o'clock, I'm good. I'll wake up at 6 o'clock or 5.30 or something. And I'll do a short warm-up stretch routine that I've been doing for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, just drink possibly some uh, water with lime juice and a couple of other things maybe in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm and uh, go go check the waves and mm -hmm. if the waves are good i'll surf and then i'll come back and typically have breakfast around 11 o'clock or something like that mm -hmm. and i'm only eating two meals a day mm -hmm. what do so you eat i'm sorry what did you say what do you eat what do i eat breakfast will either be fruit with cottage cheese and uh, vitamins or eggs 
with uh, coconut oil on some toast and some butter. Mm -hmm. And then my second meal will typically be a salad and tuna fish or brown rice. I've always loved mashed potatoes mm -hmm. ever Who since doesn't? I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. And I just recently found that I can buy some mashed potatoes freshly made at the market. Excuse me, I'm going to put the phone somewhere. Yeah, no okay. problem. <laughs> so I found a place where I can buy some freshly made mashed potatoes. So I'll have mashed potatoes with brown rice and some protein. You know, possibly some chicken or fish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Every so often, I'll have a smoothie with some bananas and protein powder and milk. I like milk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And actually, I've lost muscle partly because they closed the gym close to my house. Mm. And so, you know, I used to go there every week and work out with weights. And now there's no more gym. Mm -hmm. And it's probably not a good idea to go to a gym if there was one anyway. <laughs> mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I've lost some muscle and I, I, I'm hoping that when this COVID thing is over, I'll get in there and work out with some weights like I used to. Mm. How many Have days you? a week are you doing the, the lifting? I would only do it twice a week because I'm surfing five days a week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes more. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so I get plenty of exercise. It's just that weightlifting has many advantages. Mm -hmm. And one of them is you preserve or maybe build some muscle. I, uh, I'm going to find out how hard that is when mm -hmm. I get back into a gym. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you have an end of the day routine before you go to bed that kind of settles you? No, I do not. That's a great idea. <clears throat> and I keep, uh, I know that that would be very good. When I go to bed, before I go to sleep, you know, I do a very short little thing, uh, which mainly has to do with, let's see, I take some deep breaths and tell myself that the oxygen I'm taking in is going to make me stronger, younger, more flexible, and so on and so forth. You know, just a little... Mm -hmm good information for the brain to mm -hmm. hold on to i love it i love very it very cool very yeah. cool so uh i think we got to wrap up here uh is there anything else that uh, you'd like to tell our audience about surf till 100 we've got the expedition coming up we got the premiere of the movie coming up is there anything else that um i guess is there any way that they can contact you if they have more information why don't we start there uh, the best way would be the Surf Till 100 website, okay. surftill100.com. Mm -hmm. And the people who sign up will get advance notice and an invitation to the movie. Great. Very cool. Very and that's good. the newsletter you're talking about, right? The signing up for the newsletter? Correct. Awesome. Very good. Yeah. Cool.